Hi, everyone. I'm very pleased to be interviewing Irina today. Irina comes to us as a third year graduate student, rising fourth year, uh, in modern culture and media. She also is a traveler. She's from Germany. Um, and she has worked in several different occupations and studied a few different subjects. So, Irina, let's talk about your um, trajectory, your academic trajectory, your sort of occupational trajectory. Um, so something that's really interesting about Irina is that she was an elected official. Uh, now she studies politics. So I'm really curious ab about that, Irina. Tell us a bit about that. Um, so tell us about your time in office um, and also and how you think that that time has informed your work. Yes. Uh, so a few years back, um, I went back to my home county called Telte Fleming, which is um, to the south of Berlin. And uh, there I ran for the Green Party and was very lucky to gain a seat in sort of the local county council to represent people there. And I think to me that was a really, after finishing an undergraduate degree in political theory and human rights, I think that was a really formative experience in a way of like, you know, f how can you put that kind of theory in practice? And how does political collaboration actually work in practice? So both the challenges of it and the importance of it, you know, working not just within your party and within your party platform, where it's, you know, you can take certain things for granted that you already share sort of the same ideas and values, but also how do you reach, you know, out to, um, you know, build coalitions both within the community, with other parties in order to get your projects realized. Um, and so to me, I think it really uh, was a very productive challenge to the kinds of theories I had studied in undergrad mm -hmm. and then having to put them into practice and, and work them out. And so both I learned about, you know, also what this uh, you know, program is about, the, the importance of collaboration and how to talk across disciplines, across party platforms, and also, you know, to build communities, but also when to draw the line and say, you know, this is what my political values are, this is what I'm standing for, and I'm not willing to compromise on all of it. So I think that's also why uh, that working experience before coming to do my PhD uh, was really formative and important. That's great. Um, that's great. That's really interesting. Um, and I think what you're talking about will, will explain some of the background for your current dissertation project. But before we get there, let's talk about your academic trajectory. So you started off as an undergrad um, in political studies, and then you did your master's in literature, and now you're in modern culture and media. Can you reflect on that um, journey for us? Yeah, so I think I was always sort of interested in the question of both knowledge production and of power. And so I think political theory at first, I, I was really drawn to that because I've always asked myself sort of how do communities form? Um, how can we make a difference in the world? I mean, from a very sort of basic um, interest and, you know, how can we build collective power uh, in the face of injustice? And then um, sort of going from that, I, um, I wanted to ask more about the importance of language and the politics of language and sort of how we narrate and tell the stories of our communities and our world and our ideals. Um, and so that drew me also to questions of literature, you know, uh, how do we produce that kind of knowledge? How do we create shared worlds through, um, through narrative? Um, and then bringing both of those interests together, I think media studies really does that. It asks the question sort of where does power lie? How are we possibly like, um, how do systems of control or modes of power operate um, through you know, the kinds of media stories we consume and the ways information is presented to us? How do we imagine our communities into being through media? Um, but also sort of where are those gaps, like where, where does language sometimes fail us? Where can we find these openings for deconstruction or productive kinds of failure that, you know, I really took as um, formative from my time studying literary theory, that these both things always exist sort of in tension. That's great. So, so tell us about where you are now. What, what are you thinking about? Um, what are you planning for your dissertation in brief, or a part of it, doesn't have to be all of it, obviously. <laughs> yeah, of um, but, but what are sort of the things you're thinking about now? So my current project um, is about sort of three major themes or questions. Um, and the first one is, I want to think, so my medium that I'm focusing on in my studies is digital media. And I want to kind of think about uh, with digital media and one of the most central questions of political theory, which is the question of, uh, what kind of public space can a digital platform be? 
and how can it enable or disable sort of the formation of collectivities? How does it structure the way we consume information again or the ways we sort of, you know, structure communities online? And so related to that, I want to ask sort of what are the political architectures of appearance that digital platforms, you know, enable um, as well as um, sort of what would it mean maybe to care for moments of the political and for me the political stands for you know moments when what it means to be in common is open for uh, discussion or rewriting or redefinition. Um, so what would it mean to care for such moments maybe of productive failure of breakdown of common definitions um, uh, under such uh, sort of network global capitalist structures like digital platforms. So tell us about these digital platforms a little bit. What are, what are the structures that they employ? How do they kind of change the political landscape and, and political community? Um, so one thing in my own work that I focus on is not just, you know, we, we tend to think a lot about the kind of content that's hosted on the platform. But I think a lot about sort of the underlying machinic system, the kinds of formats and how they structure the ways we receive information. So I feel like, um, I mean, I feel like, I, <laughs> uh, so digital platforms are often structured by some things like algorithms, protocols, programming languages, and sort of steer us towards a homogenization of uh, formats and categories um, and a certain type of, of language. And so part of what I argue in this current project is that even though it's often overlooked, platforms hold very specific kinds of governing power about how categories get to be um, you know, instituted and how content gets to make an appearance. Uh, so there, and what get actually gets to flow into appearance on the screen and how. So um, one way this, is for, this power is exercised, for example, is through the ranking algorithm. Um, for saying, you know, this is actually the most important, this is relevant to you in your avowed subject position, so that's what we're going to put like on top of your newsfeed, and this is really just irrelevant and, you know, worthless, and you're not going to be interested in that. And that's a political power that these platforms wield in the sense of like, look, there's something that's really important to all of us. Facebook, for example, you know, has a get out the vote feature that it shows to all users based in the United States on election day. But then certain, you know, other political movements, we can, we can think about Me Too movement or Black Lives Matter, are sort of, you know, segregated into individualized interest spheres where they, they don't get to make an appearance as supposedly relevant to all, but they only, you know, uh, appear in certain news feeds, not others. So are you saying that media determines our political engagement and our political thinking? Mm -hmm. um, and can you tell us a bit about sort of your, your more general approach to these, uh, mm -hmm. to technology and to these uh, digital media platforms? Mm -hmm. So that's a really great question because I really want to reject both, like both this kind of narrative of like media is a kind of ubiquitous manipulation machine and this governing power is absolute and can absolutely determine the ways we consume information, which is definitely not true. It is a mode of power, but it fails all the time. Platforms never really, or very seldom, like they don't often work or always work as they should. Um, and there's all these moments of failure where, again, I think those are moments of the political, where sort of the algorithm shows us something we find surprising or something we haven't encountered before. But I do think we have to take the power, the governing power seriously that those uh, platforms hold. And yet we also need to show that there are these moments for creative misuse, like a productive failure that, you know, we can maybe find in the glitch or the moment of surprise um, where, you know, the user is manipulated, but the user themselves are sort of opting into like moments of refusal or the platform is sort of misused accidentally. And I think there is a lot of, you know, potential in those moments as well. So if so, can you tell us a bit about what a moment of failure looks like and sort of what the possibilities are? And also, as a follow up to that, um, if Facebook is constantly improving its algorithm, do you think those moments will go away? And does that mean that Facebook has more mm -hmm. power than than we might want? Yeah. I mean, those governing power is always adapting. So in some ways, obviously, its aspiration is to make its system run more smoothly and to no longer have those moments of what I would call failure. Um, but I think it can never be completely sort of smoothed out of existence because the platform will never work perfectly and it's the same sort of in life and the governing structures that we have um, here. People will always have these moments of both refusal or the idea of like a surprising accident that can sort of, you know, make us reckon with that which we have taken for granted in a different way. Um, but what I, what I would say, um, 
Oh, sorry, what was the second the f- one? The <laughs> first one was about um, yeah. moments of failure. What is a moment yeah. of failure oh, what and what are the moment? possibilities? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. great. <laughs> um, so there are two sides to this. So I think there is on the one hand sort of a deliberate misuse. So sometimes users give you know, false identifying information. They uh, deliberately confuse the algorithm. Or they, you know, sometimes users stage even like collective attacks on servers and try to sort of, or try to sort of, uh, you know, um, install obfuscation software or like actually program something um, that is structured by a different logic. And so I'm thinking like along uh, Kara Keeling's work on Queer OS, where she's trying to think about social operating systems, for example, that facilitate uh, along different logics. So a social operating system that would facilitate imaginative or uncommon or rational kinds of relations instead of this kind of hegemonic logic of optimization and you know the same always the same categories or the same sort of forms of connection that take place in some digital platforms. Um, but some of the failure can also be accidental. You know, the platform says it wants to do something and sometimes it doesn't work. It shows us things we find boring. <laughs> you know, it shows us content that we didn't think, you know, we would find interesting and we're surprised by. And so both of these work together to create these moments of the political, which often are also sort of surface as a surprise. We can't always know ahead of time what will challenge us to rethink what it means to be in common. Um, but I'm very interested in that moment. Yeah, so, so what can we do? Uh, what does it look like? Facebook is here. It is, it is deter- or if not determining, it is shaping how we think. What can we do? Yeah, this is a great question because in my work, I try to argue that opting out is not really an option. First of all, opting out, so saying, you know, I'm just going to delete my Facebook account, is often a very isolated and individualized gesture. And so in that sense, it doesn't build a collectivity that can really reimagine different kinds of public space. That's one part. And then the other part is opting out also thing, uh, so sort of assumes that there is some place, like some other kind of public space to opt out into. But unfortunately, what I'm seeing is that this kind of digital logic of both optimization and also the privatization of public space. So by digital platforms, we're talking about privately owned public spaces. Um, is not confined to the digital but we can find that sort of in offline spaces as well. You know, the ways that, you know, sometimes public parks, supposedly public parks, are owned by private corporations, mm-hmm. for instance. And also the logic of neoliberalism has a similar kind of, um, you know, logic of optimization that it's trying to spread. So I think for me, opting out is one strategy, but it's not sort of all, you know, not what I would want to, you know, overemphasize. And instead I'm trying to think about, you know, these practices of care that might go along with different ways of opting into technology, trying to repoliticize the way we talk about it, and also trying to reimagine sort of counter infrastructures or counter logics and how we can maybe bring those into being and reclaim that kind of public space, you know, as one where actually what it means to be in common can be redefined um, and debated. So do you have anyone that you're thinking with on this topic of care or on, on what care might look like? So I'm thinking with a lot of different thinkers, obviously, for my dissertation. I mean, one person that has come up also, we've, we've talked about him before, is Rancier, because I'm trying to think about the way the digital platforms, uh, their governing power works through the partition of the sensible. And so this is the question of sort of how is appearance uh, partitioned and uh, what does it mean that these platforms hold the power to institute categories um, or to sort of have the power of the police, Rancier calls it, to say, move along, nothing to see here. This is not important to you. This is not a political moment. We're just going to sort of use our algorithm to filter it out of appearance. And that we can actually, you know, on a street, a lot of us can sort of stumble onto something. We can see the protest. We can refuse to follow the policeman's call and to move along and disperse. But online, we don't even know this moment existed. You know, it's filtered out in a, in a layer that, that we don't you know, actually know it happened in that sense. So it's a different kind of invisibilizing power. Uh, and that's why I'm also sort of trying to think of the tension of what is actually new when we move to digital spaces. Mm-hmm. Some of the questions are very old uh, mm-hmm. and have right. been around the political theory for a long time. And then there are a few things that are actually new. And sort of I want to think through that tension too. That's great. Well, we're just about out of time, but thank you so much for joining us, Irina. Thank you.